Hello, I'm Pastor Brian from Charlestown Baptist Church. We invite you to come and join us as the church gathers for worship. But until then, we put our sermons on video so that we can be a ministry to you and your family wherever you are. God bless you. You may know this already, but I stand about six feet, two inches tall. That's a blinding flash of the obvious. And if I reach my hand up all the way like this, I can reach almost eight feet. That's exciting for me. <clears throat> because in my house, I have ceilings that are eight feet tall. And if there's a cobweb up in the corner, I can reach and kind of get them out of the way. But some houses have a ceiling that's nine feet tall or 10 feet tall. And then what do you do? I'll tell you what you do. <laughs> and with this, you can reach, that's probably 11 feet right there. But here in the sanctuary, <laughs> I can extend it, and I can reach even for the, watch this. If I extend it, I can reach even farther, right? Hmm. Interesting. Most of you already know that the main campus of West Virginia University is in the city of Morgantown. Some of you have been there many, many times, many times over. But did you also know that the West Virginia University Extension Service has a campus or an office in every one of the 55 counties of West Virginia. And they do a lot of things related to agriculture and natural resources so that there is information about how to feed your goats in every county of the state. And you can check with the experts wherever you are because they have extended their reach. Did you know the first seminary class I ever took when I was just starting out as a rookie preacher, was through a Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. But I myself have never in my life been to Louisville, Kentucky. And I took that class in Clarksville, Tennessee. Why? Because there was an extension center. And the smart people at Southern Seminary said, if we extend our reach, if we put our thing out in the community, we can reach more people. What a brilliant idea. What a fascinating subject. I was at a meeting a couple of weeks ago in Richmond, talking about ministry, talking about the growth of the kingdom, creative ways to move the church forward. And the gentleman that was leading this small seminar, he said, you might want to write this down. He said, if all we do is this, who are we going to miss? If all we do is this, who are we going to miss? I like that because it rhymes and it's easy to remember. But I like that because it causes me to think. If all we do is this... We gather on Sunday morning and we sing some songs and we pray some prayers and we preach some preachings. Who are we missing? Who are we missing? We tend to think that the rest of the world is going to respond to the gospel in the same way that we respond to the gospel. And we went to church and we heard and it was great and I kept going back and that's how I respond to the gospel. So what's wrong with all those people? So we keep doing the same things over and over, waiting for all those other folks who are not responding to the gospel in the same way you did. And if all we do is this, who are we going to miss? Just the same way that some people cannot get to Morgantown or Louisville to pursue their education, there are some people who cannot or will not get to the corner of Samuel and Congress for whatever reason. And even if they get here on the campus, what are they going to see? Sing some songs, pray some prayers, hear some preaching. How does that help them to experience the grace of God? And what did Jesus say about all these things? He said, you go. 
Matthew chapter 28, last words of the Gospel of Matthew, talks about what we call the Great Commission. You've seen these words before. We're going to look at them again today. Would you stand, please, that we would honor the reading of God's holy word? Jesus is speaking, closing out the book of Matthew, and he says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Father God, enlighten us this day. Help us to see these words in a new way and help us to apply them to our very lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Be seated, please. <clears throat> the New Testament records 12 or 13 resurrection appearances. After Jesus' crucifixion, he appeared to his disciples 12 or 13 times as was recorded in Scripture. There were probably more. There are probably the same stories being told a couple of times in a couple of different ways. So we can safely say 12 or 13. And in five of those resurrection appearances... Jesus gave his disciples a version of what we call the Great Commission, this command to go and tell. Matthew 28, what we just read, is the most familiar of them, and we like that. In Mark chapter 16, verse 15, Jesus said, go out into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Period. End of story. Now, I don't know about you, that's pretty straightforward, isn't it? <laughs> That doesn't give a whole lot of room for wiggling around or talking our way out of that. Well, no, no, no. no, go out in the world, preach the gospel, everybody you see. No room for debate. In John chapter 20, verse 21, Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. We touched on this a couple of weeks ago. In the same way that the Father has sent the Son into the world to be a peacemaker, to be a reconciler, to be an instrument of grace, to be one who bridges the gap between God and man, in the same way that Jesus came, Jesus sends you to be a reconciler, to be a peacemaker. To be an instrument of grace, to bridge the gap between God and man. To go and accomplish the things that Jesus was accomplishing on earth. He sends you in his place. Oh, that's pretty heavy, isn't it? That's a pretty big deal. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the end of of the earth. And this is part of the ascension of Christ when he returned to heaven. We're going to deal with that fully next week. Suffice to say for today, you will be a witness. You will be a witness for the gospel. Good, bad, or indifferent. And in fact, I'd go so far as to say the life that you live today tells the world exactly what you think about Jesus Christ. How does that make you feel? <laughs> you keep that to yourself and ponder on that a little bit. You will be a witness. And in Luke chapter 24, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Five different times, in five different ways, in five different places, the resurrected Savior told his people, go and tell the story. Go and tell the story. Five out of 12 or 13. Almost half, right? I'm not that good at math. That's almost half the time that Jesus showed up. He was saying something to the effect of, go and tell. If you were a wise theologian, I mean a really smart person, you might come to the conclusion that Jesus wants us to go and tell. <laughs> go and tell. It's part and parcel of living as a disciple. 
And this is not something that was tacked on at the end of it all when Jesus had to go away. All the way in the beginning when he was calling his disciples in Matthew chapter 4, he said, come follow me and I'm going to do what? Fishers of men. You're going to be about in the business of souls back to the kingdom. You're going to be in the business of restoration. This is what it's all about. Come follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. In Mark chapter 3, he appointed 12 that they might be with him and learn from him and be transformed by him so that he might send them out to tell the story of Jesus. That's all the way at the beginning too. Part and parcel of the gospel that we carry the message of grace to the world. Because if we don't do it, Christians, who do you think is? You think Twitter's all going to suddenly get on there and start sharing the gospel with the world? You think CNN even cares? It is us. It falls to us to evangelize the world, to tell the world what Jesus is about and who he is and what he has done for us. Go tell the world. So let's think for a minute and let's strategize for a minute. And how does the church in North America, in our experience, do that? How do we go and tell? I'll tell you what we do for the most part. We build great big brick buildings with stained glass and a lot of seats. And we say, y'all come. Don't we? We say, y'all come to church with us. Come on to church with us. We got a great preacher. We got a band. We play guitars at our church. Come on. It's great. Y'all come. Y'all come. And we fuss and worry because people don't come. And we say, what's wrong with you? Come with us. We gather here on Sunday just like this. God's people in their suits and ties and their hair's all nice and fixed up. We gather on Wednesday. We got dinner on Wednesdays. Come on, we got food. Four dollars, you can't beat it. Come on to church. We have special events. We have breakfast for the ladies at the potluck thing because it's Mother's Day coming up. So we do something special. Say, y'all come. Come to the thing. We do a youth lock-in and say, y'all come. Bring your friends and come. Come, come, come. I spent half a week putting together a message to tell when the people come to church. We think to ourselves, this is church. We think to ourselves, this is the kingdom of God. And it's happening right here at the corner of Samuel and Congress. Y'all come. But what did Jesus say? He said, you go. You go. He didn't say, y'all come. He said, you, disciples of Jesus, go. Could it be that we're doing this whole thing wrong? For all these years, we got this backwards. You all, followers of Jesus, you got to go. You got to go be instruments of grace in your family, in your workplace, in your community. You got to go as a representative of the kingdom everywhere you go. Oh, man, but that's so hard. It's just easier to come here and sit on a Sunday and I soak it in, play the music, sing the song, and I go away. Go, therefore. Go make disciples. Go. And if all we do is this, who are we going to miss? We sit here, we think that the kingdom of God is happening inside these four brick walls. We think that the kingdom of God is somehow confined to Congress and Samuel and the back alley and Mildred. Say, this is where it's happening, y'all come, y'all come on, come on, it's great, we got the best church in town, we got the best preacher, we got the best music, we got the best building, we got the best program, y'all come. And Jesus said, nowhere, come. He said, you go take the kingdom. The kingdom of God is out there, waiting for God's people to build it. And that's you, my friends. 
Now listen, the things that we do here are important. I'm not minimizing the gathering. This is good. This is important. It's here for your discipleship. It's here so that I can teach you some things. It's here so that we can grow our faith and exercise our gifts. This is not the end game. This is not the goal. If our goal is build a big church, this is the goal. Y'all come, build a bigger church, get a crowd. Church is not the goal. Kingdom of God is the goal. Kingdom of God is the goal. Grace and mercy and hope and life is the goal. And you are its representatives. Most of you have seen science fiction movie of some sort, right? I assume you've seen Star Wars at least, right? Raise your hand if you've seen Star Wars. Okay, most of you. Thank you. This is interactive church. This is participative. So you have the big giant spaceships that float along way out in the vastness of the unknown. And they're just kind of cru- the battle cruisers, I think they're called, right? And then you have all the little smaller ships that are coming and going from the battle. There's like the flight deck where they fly off into space and the X-wing fighters go shoot the bad guys. And the transport ships that you go and you settle the isolated planet and all those other small ships that fly in and out around the giant battle cruiser. You with me? Yes? You saw that? You saw that scene, right? Good. This is the mothership and all of you are the X-Wing fighters to go out there and do the work. Another analogy. Big corporations. They'll have their main headquarters, their corporate offices in a city of whatever. They are in Cincinnati. I don't know why. Anybody go to Cincinnati? But They have a big office there and there's uh, boardrooms and executive things and administration and all that stuff. But then in every city around the country, in like Dayton, and in like Akron, and in like Parkersburg, they'll have satellite offices where they actually do the sales, where they interface with the customers, where they represent their product out in the whole wide world. And the work is actually getting done. This is the main office. Your living room is a satellite of the kingdom of God. Your workplace is a satellite campus of the kingdom of God. And it is up to you to bring some kingdom into it. You've heard of, if you're still working these days, which some of us are. If you're you're still working, you've heard the newest catchphrase in the corporate world these days that's called work-life balance. Work-life balance, as if our work life and our personal life were separate things and we could distance from one another and find some kind of harmony between the two so we don't be like laying up on the sofa watching Wheel of Fortune every day, but we're also not like workaholic and going driving ourselves crazy. So we find balance, harmony between those things, right? Some of you know. Or maybe you don't. I don't know. But just imagine if it were. I think it's a reflection of a segregated life where we take all the various elements of our lives and we try to separate them into different categories. Our work life, our home life, our personal life, our hobbies, our commerce, and in the attractional church model, even church. These are all the things that we give our time and effort to. These are all the things that we participate in. And we try to put them in their own little categories. In the attractional, in the y'all come church philosophy, it's just another element of life. It's what we do for Sunday morning. There may have been a time and a place where that worked. It's not going to work in the postmodern world. It's not going to work in the new millennium, and it's not working today. Jesus said, go. Go take the kingdom with you wherever you go. And if we take that graphic and we start to live missionally, 
if we start to think, if we stop thinking about going to church and start thinking about being part of a kingdom, we carry the kingdom with us everywhere we go. And then that kingdom begins to penetrate and infiltrate and sanctify all the elements of society. And kingdom is being fulfilled in this way. The attractional church, it doesn't, it doesn't make a bit of difference in the world. The missional church says, go. Go. And by being kingdom rather than going to church, we carry the grace of God with us. And we share that grace with a world that needs some grace and needs some hope and needs some love. So let me ask you these couple of questions and get you pondering and thinking. Does the kingdom of God extend into your home? And is the place where you live a place of grace? What have you done to help your workplace be a satellite campus of the kingdom of God. What are you doing to bring grace into your social circle of unchurched friends? How can your hobbies, your education, your commerce reflect kingdom? And what might could you do about it? Go, therefore, make disciples of all the nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the edge, to the end of the age. Amen. Father God, we thank you that you love us the way you do. We thank you for kingdom. We thank you for a mandate in this kingdom. And we thank you, God that you give us the capability and the responsibility to do your work. And I pray your blessings upon your people, that as we go, we go with grace and power and strength and love, and we reflect your truth and your values in every corner of the world. And as we prepare our hearts for the, for the table, Lord, that you gave to us this beautiful remembrance of your sacrifice, I pray, Lord, we truly would examine ourselves that we would confess to you that we would find peace and grace and truth through your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In just a few minutes, we are going to participate in the Lord's table, this beautiful time of remembrance. And I invite you to participate with us if you're a believer in Jesus Christ as your Savior. The Apostle Paul was writing to the church at Corinth, and he said, before you do that, examine yourself. Check it out. Look in your own heart and see if you're good with God, if you're straight with God. And I hope you are, and I pray that you are. And if you're not, hey, all you got is to say, God, I've done this, and I ain't straight, and I want to be. It's called repentance. It's a change of heart, and it draws us back to God. And God is gracious to us, and he always welcomes us with open arms. So maybe you've got something on your heart. Maybe you've got to confess something to a brother or sister in the Lord tonight, today. Maybe you want to pray with me, whatever it is. Just take this time of reflection and kind of cleanse yourself and meditate on it all and, and, and give God the glory. And we'll then we'll go into the Lord's table. Would you stand, please? The altar is open for prayer. My prayer that this sermon has been a blessing to you and that the Lord spoke to you through these words. We appreciate your participation. If we can be of ministry to you or your family, feel free to give us a call at the church office, 304-725-5917. We look forward to hearing from you. Until then, God bless you.